Gwendolyn Brooks's achievements are legendary. The author of hundreds of poems, among them several staples of American literature anthologies, Brooks won the Pulitzer Prize in 1949 and served as the Poet Laureate of Illinois. In 1989, she received a Lifetime Achievement Award from the National Endowment of the Arts, and she was named the 1994 Jefferson Lecturer by the National Endowment for the Humanities, the highest honor bestowed by the federal government for work in the humanities. Born in 1917 in Topeka, Kansas, Brooks is known for her commitment to racial identity and equality, as well as her mastery of poetic techniques, and is recognized as one of the most distinguished American poets of the 20th century. Brooks's writing was encouraged by her parents from a young age. In fact, she began publishing poetry in the Chicago Defender's weekly variety column when she was 13, and by the time she graduated from Inglewood High School in 1934, she'd already made considerable progress in mastering traditional poetic forms. In the 1930s and early 40s, Brooks progressed rapidly in mastering the techniques that would characterize her first volume of poetry, and she was encouraged by teachers and the Harlem Renaissance poet James Walden Johnson. By the late 1930s, she had a considerable body of poems, including 75 that had been published in the Chicago Defender. In 1941, Gwendolyn Brooks and her husband attended a poetry workshop at the Southside Community Arts Center called the Poetry Class. Here Brooks learned a lot about modern poetry techniques, and many of the poems in Brooks's first collection, A Street in Bronzeville, were written during this workshop. A Street in Bronzeville was published in 1945, and the book was well received. Brooks maintained that A Street in Bronzeville had, quote, a rather folksy narrative nature, and I guess that is one way to get poetry in front of people to tell stories. Everyone loves stories. These poetic stories were about the everyday lives of the people who lived in a Chicago neighborhood affectionately called Bronzeville by its residents. The video excerpt that follows provides a glimpse into this vibrant community that Brooks celebrated in her poetry collection of the same name. Take a look. Bronzeville is both a place and a spirit of the sons and daughters of the Great Migration to this northern city who came up by way of New Orleans, up through Memphis, up through Chicago, up to Chicago seeking the promised land and uh, were literally restricted by legal restricted covenants imposed by people associated with the University of Chicago who wanted to contain that mass migration in a narrow band of land three and a half miles by a mile and a half wide that came to be known as Bronzeville or i.e. Black Metropolis. It was a place because of the concentration of people. Uh, you had 300,000 people scrammed into a narrow band of land uh, at its height. Uh, so you had people in kitchenettes and piled on top of one another, uh, commerce everywhere, restaurants, clubs, businesses, etc., buoyed by and supported by the numbers racket, right? Which brought the, these gentlemen were making $20 million a year. Right, and they underwrote a lot of businesses that were owned by African Americans. So it was a bustling uh, metropolis, if you will, of African Americans seeking greater mobility, seeking economic empowerment, seeking their emancipation, having av having survived Jim Crow uh, lynchings, right, and come to the northern city and working for the first time, where they work side by side by other races of people and earned a living wage. And so the dollar circulated, based on us not being able to go outside that community, the dollar circulated eight, nine, ten times. And so you had a very vibrant, though repressed, community. It was a very vibrant community, full of culture and arts, which also flourished at that same time. Annie Allen, which appeared in 1949, 
was her next book of poems, and this collection continued the movement of Brooks's poetry towards social issues. Annie Allen is concerned with the maturation of a young black woman. Following the apparent simplicity of a street in Bronzeville, Annie Allen was celebrated by reviewers who loved the collection's complexity and stylistic developments. One critic even noted that the imagery of Annie Allen rises to quote the mythic, and it was for this collection that Brooks received the Pulitzer Prize in 1950 at the young age of 32. In 1953, Brooks published her only novel, Maud Martha, grounded in part in her own experiences. Brooks tells the story of a young woman emerging from romantic dreams to grasp realistic fulfillment as a young wife and mother. Bronzeville Boys and Girls, which was published in 1956, is a book of poetry for children that mixes poems with bouncing rhymes, and those with more subtle and varied sound patterns. The book creates a world in which childhood disappointments are overshadowed by joy, beauty, freedom, love, and imaginative flights of fancy. A 2006 edition of the book was illustrated by the well-known artist Faith Ringgold, making this a classic children's book. The Bean Eaters, which appeared in 1960, is a collection of poetry by Brooks that explores the complexity of black lives, emphasizing strength and self-reliance. Again, she drew heavily upon the lives of the people she knew on Chicago's South Side in the neighborhood of Bronzeville. Writing during the early years of the Civil Rights Movement, Brooks's interest in social issues is on full display. In fact, reviewers reviewers have noted that the greatest influence on her life and writing from the 1960s onward was her commitment to black solidarity. Indeed, during the 1960s, Brooks became more involved in the civil rights movement, protesting radio censorship of her work and participating in poetry festivals hosted by President John F. Kennedy. And her contact with young black artists of Chicago inspired her to sponsor many different writing workshops. Perhaps her most famous poem from the late 1960s is called In the Mecca. It's a long poem about the lives of those dwelling in a high-rise housing project. Brooks died at the age of 83 in 2000, a celebrated poet, intellectual, and civil rights leader. I will end with this brief video of Brooks talking about the now famous story of when she learned of winning the Pulitzer Prize, as well as a clip of her reciting one of her most famous poems, We Real Cool. Of winning the Pulitzer, and you won it when I think you were 33, which is, I guess, as a writer, would be very young in terms of winning that type of award. Uh, was there any sort of jealousy from some of your peers in terms of here it is, all of a sudden you win the Pulitzer Prize at 33? 32. 32. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> if there was, they didn't tell me, and I was too excited and happy to be looking for any such uh, uh, evidences. My friends were. Uh, uh, seemingly very proud and happy. It was something that hadn't happened to a black before, so they were glad on that score. <laughs> uh, we had a lot of celebrations, I remember. How did you hear about it? Because it's always the thing in terms of the person being notified. Mm -hmm. How did you hear about it? Where, where were you when you heard you had won the, the Pulitzer Prize? I was in a house at 9134 Wentworth, and the lights were out. That's been told many times by now. Uh, we hadn't paid the electric bill, so there was no electricity. And uh, it was dusk, so it was dark in the house. <laughs> My son was nine at the time. Jack Starr, a reporter 
on the Sun Times called. He is now associated with Chicago Magazine, was uh, one of the editors, till, senior editor, till just recently. So he said, uh, do you know that you have won the Pulitzer Prize? And I said, no, and screamed over the telephone. I couldn't believe it. So he said, well, it was true. And it would be announced the next day. The next day, reporters came, photographers came with cameras, and I was absolutely petrified. Uh, I wasn't going to say anything about the electricity. I knew that when they put in their... <laughs> when they tried to attach their cameras and all, nothing was going to happen. However, miraculously, somebody had turned the electricity back on that fast. I've never known exactly what happened. Only many times writers um, are thought of in terms of one poem. Sometimes people think of, you know, Langston Hughes and, you know, I've known Rivers. And it seems as if when people think of Wendell Brooks sometimes, they think of, you know, we're real cool. And I think that's a poem that's been anthologized quite a, quite a bit. Um, how do you feel about that poem? Well, it's the only poem that I've written that sounds exactly like that, but it has been published in a lot of anthologies and school textbooks. Children like it, young uh, people like it, because it has a kind of insouciance and a, uh, a staccato effect that they enjoy. And I was really um, gratified when I read it and have uh, talked about poetry at the Howard Woodson High School in Washington here. And uh, young people, boys, uh, that first time, because I've gone back and they've done it again <laughs> and with uh, girls in the mixture, uh, jumped up from all over the, the, the large room, the library, uh, chanting that poem, snapping their fingers rhythmically. And I, I love that. Uh, if you want to have a little background on the poem, I wrote it because I was passing by a pool hall in my neighborhood in Chicago one afternoon, and uh, I saw, well, as I said in the poem, seven boys shooting pool. And I wondered how they felt about themselves, and I decided that they felt they were not quite valid, that they certainly were insecure, they were not cherished, by the society, and uh, therefore they would uh, feel that uh, they should, well, spit in the face of the establishment. I use the month of June as uh, a symbol, an establishment symbol, whereas the rest of us love and respect June and <laughs> wait for it to come so we can enjoy it. They would jazz June, as I said it before. Uh, derange it, scratch in it. <laughs> Do anything that would annoy the establishment. Could I get you to recite that poem? I'd love to hear the way you read it and accent it. The pool players, yes. seven at the golden shovel. We real cool, we left school we lurk like we strike straight we sing sin we thin gin we jazz june we die soon <laughs>